Welcome to the Practical Enneagram. In this world where everyone is a teacher, the onus is on the student to choose their teachers wisely. Ginger Lapid Boda's teaching style is for me uniquely engaging and multidimensional. Aside from the obvious depth to her knowledge and experience in using the Enneagram in coaching, teaching and organisational development, she is warm and generous and has a deep compassion for the learning experience. There's also an intimacy to the learning containers she creates at the Enneagram in business, even more valuable in a time where everything is recorded and learning groups can be quite large. When you take a course with her, she'll send you a raft of gorgeous and useful materials, including typing and discovery cards that you can use as part of a typing process. We spoke for a long time, so I'm separating the interview into two parts. In part one, we mainly talk about what a good metaphor can do for teaching the Enneagram. What Ginger shares in the beginning is also a powerful lesson in how your own problem or challenge can become the seed of your gift bearing in the world. Ginger, it's lovely to see you again. I've been looking forward to it. Thank you. Me too. Yeah. You know, reading about all the exotic fruits in your book has given me... is. It's made me hungry for travel even more because I'm quite a big traveler, like like you, I think. I Travel was a passion of mine, you know, like culture, people, food, sort of architecture. And, you know, I used to do that. That was like one of my favorite things to do. Mm. And then when I, after I wrote my first book and then I started traveling, that's like 17 years. You know, I've been traveling so much for work to teach people how, how to teach the Enneagram and to how to coach with the Enneagram and, and also with direct client work. I miss the travel for its own sake. I don't mind being in an airplane for 18 hours, which I've been in many. It's the packing. I just seem to have a resistance to like packing. Like how do I know? And if I'm going to several locations where the temperatures are different or the dress code is different, then it's like it becomes a daunting task. So, so I don't I don't mind unpacking, but I hate packing. Packing is a joyless activity and I always overpack. I know. Well, I, I stopped overpacking because yeah. of the it's um, I have a bad back. Mm. You know, see how I have to be able to lift it and not mm. hurt my back. Right. Mm-hmm. So the way around that it was to pack lighter. But then it makes takes away what do you feel like wearing this day well I don't have many choices do I now oh well maybe we can work on this together Ginger I'll keep you in mind (laughs) (laughs) moving on to our topic so as you know I want to talk with you about teaching and our conversation sits within the moment in the Enneagram um, world of sort of giant grumble about how the Enneagram is being taught and and it's nothing new is it Ginger because I think you're your colleague, and I know your dear friend, Don Rizzo, um, and Helen Palmer, as I understand it, they also argued about the Enneagram. I heard someone describe it recently, like it was divorcing parents, their argument about the way the Enneagram would be taught. Well, I didn't experience it that way. No, They didn't really communicate. Oh, they didn't. Not no. really. I mean, they were like two, in that period, two very different schools, although they had a lot more in common than they had indifference, but it was very different and a lot of ways. And it was then we're talking about the 70s, 80s, right? And just yeah. into the 90s. And so they didn't really communicate. So for, for me, the metaphor, because we're talking about yeah. metaphor, family, yeah, doesn't quite fit unless they were, well, you couldn't even use divorced parents because they were never married <laughs> in that sense, metaphorically. You know, this whole thing about what's the real Enneagram. I mean, it's pervasive and it's predates mm. Helen and mm. Don dramatically. It does. Really, the the um the disagreement about what the Enneagram is and how ha- yeah. yeah. And I mean, but the thing is it carries on, right? Yeah, right now, I mean the pr- prominent grumble is the way it's being reduced and and memed and and all of that stuff. And and um I can understand the disgruntlement, especially from the perspective of a teacher that's been teaching for a long time. I hope not to contribute to it myself. But. Well, you know, I have a view on this. You know, the Enneagram was an oral teaching. It was an mm-hmm. oral tradition. And then people sometimes took notes, right? Mm-hmm. And then there was a big brouhaha. Oh, my God, you can't put this in books because it's supposedly oral. Right. Yeah. You see, and then people went crazy about that. It's like, no books, no, you know. You know, and my my view is always I was that's when I first came in, but 
It's like a book is something you say it in out loud, right? That's mm-hmm. a, and then books. And then there was a brouhaha. Oh, after books, books are now okay, but you can't put it on websites. Well, websites mm-hmm. is a different platform. We see. So mm-hmm. then it goes like, and when I did, I have this app called know your type that's mm-hmm. available for the Apple. So then it was like, I remember hearing an, a teacher, no names, yell at me on the phone. You can't be doing this on an app. That's, mm-hmm. you know, diluting the da, 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 da. And I'm like, well, what's the difference between a website and an app? Right. Yeah. So now there's all the technology is such a different sp- space. And yes, there's people coming in, teaching it who maybe um, some people and maybe me too, wish they'd had a deeper knowledge base before they went out. And I look at some of that and I go, that's not right. That's mm-hmm. not true. This isn't really, um, but that's always been the case. You know, there were people writing books before they were, in my view, ready because they didn't understand well enough. And, Mm -hmm. you know, Don and I were very close and he and I would talk about things like this. And he would Mm -hmm. say, I usually probably heard me say this. He would bring it up, something up or I would, but about what was going on. And then he would say, Ginger, don't worry about the Enneagram. It's more powerful than any of us. It will outlive this. And I believe that to be true. I would describe your teaching style, which you deliver through your online workshops and across all of your written materials, of which there are many on Enneagram and Enneagram and Business Portal, Learning Portal, as hugely inviting, practical and profound. Can you say a bit about the origins of your work as an educator? I grew up in a family that was very mental and very auditory. My mother was a six, my father was a five, and my brother, who was the closest in age to me, is a six. So it's a very mental-centered, you know, there I am, a heart-centered person. (laughs) So, and in my family, you had to do well in school. Okay, but schools are taught mentally. They're Mm. taught in an auditory way. And so I did quite well in school, Mm -hmm. but I had to work really hard at it. And I didn't understand until kind of I got to like maybe graduate school a little bit. Why? Mm. And it's because I'm not an auditory learner. Yeah. Yeah. I, and most, there's actually fewer auditory learners than other words. Otherwise, right. There's auditory, kinesthetic, and visual, mm. and I'm a visual kinesthetic. So then as I got, you know, into graduate school, well, I, I started teaching in an inner city, mm-hmm. an urban environment, and I didn't do it because I was an educator. I did it as a sort of more of a social action. Mm, mm, right. It's like I wanted kids, those kids especially, but kids to have the tools and resources they needed to ch- choose what they wanted to do in their lives. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, okay. So I'm teaching third graders with, and see, that's maybe, well, maybe the six year old to the 10 year old group mm, over mm. time. They're not that auditory. I mean, they don't sit still. So I had to develop teaching techniques. I also then ended up in a girl's school Mm. teaching things, you know, also social action, you know, Mm -hmm. teaching them woodworking and teaching them all kinds of things. But it was, they learned best by doing. So I learned very early that it was really important to do visual, auditory, and kinesthetic. Gosh, I can really see how the compassion for the learner began there in your own. Yeah, it's all about the learner. So that can just carried forward. And I think when, I, as I got further along in my own life and work and all that, and I became an organizational consultant mm-hmm. and behavioral science is my, you know, that's what my, basically my degrees in education, but it's in behavioral sciences. It's beyond just education, mm-hmm. uh, you know, sociology, psychology, anthropology, you know, those mm-hmm. things. Um, we use models, representations of reality that aren't reality, but they're bring us a little closer to understanding it. And one of the things that I learned there is that if I was, were using a model, if I didn't, couldn't draw the model, if I couldn't draw it, I didn't understand it, right? So I would sort of put my ideas down in, in visual terms, right? Mm-hmm. Then when I have my first book, Bringing Out the Best in Yourself at Work. Mm-hmm. So my publisher, McGraw-Hill, um, they said, I had a different, that was when I first started putting um, it, graphic images into mm-hmm. books, right? Because mm-hmm. a lot of the underground books, as you even still yeah. don't have that, right? Mm-hmm. Or they're decorative. And mine were, mine were for learning to kind of mm-hmm. anchor. 
they said too expensive for us to use all these graphics mm. because it's more expensive to put those in. It I wasn't that time. Yeah, yeah. And now it isn't, but right. then it was because we didn't have just in time digital, but they, there was a chat, but they said your book's also too long. A book should only be like an inch and a half thick. So I said, okay, I'll take out the coaching chapter. If you let the graphics stay in, mm. they really wanted the book. I was, that was my negotiation. <laughs> so that's how those got in. It was pretty funny. <laughs> and then the more I write and the more I teach and the more I share and the more graphical I get. And who were your early like inspirational teachers, Ginger, or who did you connect with as a teacher? That I none? never did. <laughs> really? Well, yeah. you know, that, and that was, you know, I wish I had had mm-hmm. on one hand. And on the other hand, it freed me up to do things the way mm-hmm. I wanted to do them. Right. Mm-hmm. It, and it's not that I, I did have people who I thought, you know, were good teachers. I, I had an English teacher and I wrote something once and he thought it was pretty cool. And so mm-hmm. I got, Oh, okay. He gets me in terms of mentors or role models. I mean, I think of somebody who inspires, right. Somebody you look, one looks up to, yeah. you want to be like, you can sort mm-hmm. of model after you can this, I just, that wasn't in my life. Yeah. Yeah. So that's not to say there weren't people I respected. Of course. No, I know that. And you speak. And there's not to say there aren't people I learned from. Yeah. But no one um, really powerful for you as a teacher of of Mm -hmm. the Enneagram. No. Mm. Or anywhere else. And then when I got into the Enneagram, which I never planned to teach it, I just Mm -hmm. got into it for my own. There's early 19, just looking for something at a growth center that I'd been to that had great organic food. Mm -hmm. And this was the only program that I hadn't been to. I mean, it was very random Mm -hmm. or was it right. And then it was after a a week of that, I thought, okay, well, I kind of like this. I'm going to use it for my own personal development. It sort of Mm -hmm. works for me, Mm -hmm. even though I didn't like personality systems, but you see, I don't think of the Enneagram as a personality system. How do you think of it, Ginger? Well, uh, see, those gets into metaphor. A map. You think of it as a map? Well, it's no, I, that goes into tool. A lot of people refer to the Enneagram as a tool. Mm, mm. And I would say, when you think of tool res, what do you think of? It's not quite right. Is it a tool is something you use to get something done. So it's not that. Um, no, it's yeah. usually when you're um, building something that doesn't exist or you're uh, fixing something. Yeah, that's broken. Yeah. That's broken. Mm-hmm. So Which you go wrench, hammer, screw. So mm-hmm. the Enneagram isn't bad because mm-hmm. we're not we're not broken. We don't need a wrench. Mm-hmm. Oh, we, we are and we're not. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so for me, it's like uh, the, uh, the Enneagram because I it's not just type, but it's the the symbol and the use of it and the, where we, our type fits in the context of the whole symbol and how you can use all. So it's a map, even at the individual level, it's a map of um, transformational journey. Mm-hmm. It's a map of, uh, if you go beyond type and into the, you know, the rim and the arrows and all the meta levels, it's definitely a map of consciousness and transformation. Mm-hmm. So it's not a tool, you see? So mm-hmm. I can't go with tool. After you met with the Enneagram, you sensed quickly it was being spoken about in a sort of incorrect way. Yeah, I was never comfortable with that. And then Mm. I I was also kind of a fan, if you will, of Claudio Naranjo's work. Um, And I sort of read everything of his that I could in English because I don't speak Spanish well Mm. enough to read in Spanish. So, Mm. And he would call it any types or sometimes he referred to it like ego flat for the flattery for the two. Oh, yeah, I've seen those names. Right. That's a lot of different things, but not personality. It's like, okay, Mm. right. Now I'm also trained as a gestalt therapist. Oh yes, that's right. I forgot that. Mm. Yeah. So that has had a big influence because I see, we're taught to see pattern and to see holes. Right. Yeah. Not H-O-L-E-S, but see things in a holistic way. The pattern he's using any uh, type he's using, but he's not using, it's like, it's not personality then there's something called character which doesn't mean like characters in a play which I do use sometimes we're all mm-hmm. characters in this play life but character is more like good or bad character you have good right. character bad characters mm-hmm. and then there's ego structure which mm-hmm. actually in the psychological and the spiritual literature is one and the same it's strategies for dealing with the world yes but it's mm-hmm. also p- patterns of deep uh assumptional thinking mm-hmm. and emotional response patterns you know, idealized self and defense. It's a whole construct. Mm. that's much bigger than personality. So 
you know, I teach it like as ego structure or ego architecture or the nine mm-hmm. architectures, archetypes, but I don't even like archetypes because, so much because most people think when we think archetypes, we're thinking Jungian archetypes mm-hmm. because when we think structure, what do you think? You, like layers and building blocks and yeah. Yeah. Right. So that takes us someplace. Mm, that mm-hmm. just naming it as personality doesn't take us. Mm, mm-hmm. Let's 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 talk about your book because I've just read it. So the art of the Enneagram: Nine Paths to Awareness, Acceptance, and Transformation. So it's what you wrote with your son, um, Trey. Yeah. The first book that you Trace. wrote with. Oh, Trey. Sorry. With yeah, an S. Yeah. It means three in Spanish. But his nickname Trace was given away before we knew he was a three. For me, it's just like both deep and a delight on the senses like your other books that I've read so there's a chapter on each type a final chapter on how to self-observe which is a very good chapter and an appendix which includes some sort of deep teaching about distinguishing types wings and arrows self-mastery levels but each chapter really evokes type not just with the use of written description although there is that in there so right. we have hakus, which is a Japanese short form poem. We have favorite acronyms of the types. We have their favorite songs and sports and a story. And for me, this book really celebrates art and well symbology and places them on equal footing to words when it comes to decoding the Enneagram. So I think I think there are 48 metaphors in the book, Ginger. There are five per per type and two really excellent ones in the final chapter and the appendix. And there could be more than that, because you know what I didn't count and I realize is in the in the um, coming home practices of which there are three per type. There are some in there as well. So I I think I might have um, be slightly under, but there's definitely in the region of 50. I don't know, but I think we're going to count ourselves. (laughs) See what we think. So, so did you? I'm going to show you. Did you count the icon for type three as a metaphor? <gasps> no, I didn't. So there we are. There's a there's a metaphor right there. Is, did you perceive the landscape for each type as a metaphor? I didn't perceive it as a metaphor, so I haven't counted it. Okay, so because and there's metaphors within each of the landscapes. Okay, <gasps> no. so then now you probably counted the trophies. Did you? Uh, ye- I think so. I think so, Ginger. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm not going to quiz you too much on that, but. <laughs> and they, they all these metaphors, they point to something, don't they? That words that sometimes words can't do. And I mm-hmm. love the one that you offer in the, um, in the homecoming practices. So the dimmer switch metaphor for fours yeah. like, as a way to filter mm-hmm. out all of that crap that's coming in a, a lot of the time. Yeah. So, and filter is a metaphoric word, but then it's a mm. little, but it just say to force stop taking everything inside without thinking about it first or something. Yeah. What does that mean? Mm. The filter is a, what kind of filter? And so, you know, and then dimmer switch is a filter. So it's just yeah. to get people thinking about what different kind of filters are controlling mm. what comes in. So you don't just take it in as if it's true about you. Yeah. And so helpful. Um, I love the rose metaphor for the one as well. You know, the thing of being the perfect you, rose. Yeah. With so beautiful. Claws and all. Yeah. yeah. And so what what would you say about I think you've already probably spoken to this enough, but what would you say about the power of metaphor in teaching anything and and especially the Enneagram, maybe? It's really important because people, what is metaphor? It isn't the thing itself, but it represents the thing. Mm-hmm. And it can add complexity in a simple name, label. Mm-hmm word or picture, pictures or metaphors too, that you might have to spend three paragraphs explaining. So it's kind of like people also remember metaphors longer. They stay with you longer. So it's good for retention, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, so a a metaphor can be very helpful for people to sort of understand what is the essence of what a person Mm -hmm. needs to know about a type without all the complexity. They don't take up that much space. They don't. They're just in one thing. Mm. You, if, it, if the metaphor is a good one or what you're trying to communicate, you can take much less time. People remember it more. Mm. It can hit the right brain as well as the left brain. Mm-hmm. And you're not going blah, 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 blah. So let me ask you this. Just I thought I would just do this. I <laughs> thought this. So, Rez, 
you know, you've had a journey, quite a journey. That's a metaphor, finding your type, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. In a way that feels true for you. Mm -hmm. What would be a metaphor for what that journey has been for you? I mean, like the immediate one I think of is a me- of a metamorphosis. Okay, so yeah, so t- share what that means to you, a meta- mm. the metamorphosis. Um, there was a shedding of like a veil that was that came off. Mm. So the metamorphosis, mm. right? Can can is a beautiful metaphor and then with a little bit of more information about what that is to you right it's a, mm. the shedding of a veil I shed skins well it actually unveiled me to mm. who I am yeah so what a beautiful metaphor to describe when you're teaching what the enneagram can do for you, other people mm. if you're teaching it to people how lovely I never thought of it as opposed to well let me tell you about what the enneagram can do for you <laughs> it can do this it can do that right yeah and what a good illustration for sort of fledging teachers or even anyone using this in their development to, yeah, think of their own metaphors, actually, or, or put, put their own experience into metaphor. Um, what's your favorite metaphor in the in the book, Ginger? Do you have one? Oh, my goodness. Yes, I do. Hard? Yeah, you do. Grace and I both do. And tell me both of yours, if you can remember his. It's the well. same one. The, oh, the one that I don't favorite, but makes us laugh. What is it? Um, for type six, the landscaped. Go to it's on page 62. Look at the bridge. <laughs> yeah. You see, for every other type, their path and journey is is different, but it's still landscape. And they're always on the ground, except for type nine, who's on a river. But yeah. here you have in type six, they're actually on a bridge that has missing slab, right? <laughs> and they're kind of scared and yeah. trying to deal with it. And if they fall, they're gonna fall either into something that's a ravine or You know, that's not good, right? No. And we think it's funny that it's the first time you're not on the ground because, ah, but then if you go to the last page for the type, which is on type 670, look at the bridge. It looks like it's all grounded. It's got, you know, it's like it is on top of things and you're looking. Um, So you're holding these, you're brainstorming, having Facebook, what, monthlies, where you're brainstorming metaphors with your community. That sounds fun. Well, it's really, you know, we are doing live, we're experimenting, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. It can be a good way to anchor someone's sort of self-observations as well. So there's a serious element to it, isn't there? Yeah. So uh, there the, the, the can be sort of a metaphor for a current a current way and then a metaphor for a new a new possibility for that person. That's right. Yeah, yeah. You know, like as soon as you're awake to it, the Enneagram world is full of them, right? Like there's red flags, there's trances, they're everywhere, these me- metaphors for, for this. and um... Right. So one of the things about metaphors, so because I've actually um, – it's related to story. And I, I'm, when I teach people how to teach the Enneagram, which I do in the advanced art mm. of typing, right? Um, it's about story. So of course, Trace and I similarly go and we research stuff that we already know mm. something about, but just to find more. So the thing about the metaphor or the story mm. is it has to be something that people can relate to. So it can't be obscure. Right. But if it's too common or becomes common, it's not interesting. And when it becomes too common or not interesting, it's uh, not useful anymore as a metaphor. It's interesting. Yeah. I hope you enjoyed that. And um, apologies for my giddiness. I was excited to talk with Ginger and find her a lot of fun. So um, if you liked the interview, I'd love it if you left me a rating or even a review on the service that you listened from. And um, do look out for that part too.